Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Kale Ortho Podcast. Today, our special guest is our very own Dr. Alan Zolkowitz, the Chief of Rheumatology at the Kale Orthopedic Center. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Zolkowitz. Thank you so much. It's such an honor and privilege to have Dr. Zolkowitz with us today. Dr. Zolkowitz is a renowned rheumatologist, and we're so privileged to have him practice with us at the Kale Orthopedic Center, servicing the community of patients in northern New Jersey and New York. Before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about your education, training, and your family life as well? Yes, hi. I'm Dr. Alan Zolkowitz, and I started the uh, Rheumatology Fellowship uh, Program at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City uh, many years ago and helped run the arthritis clinics at Mount Sinai in autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. When I came to northern New Jersey, I was the only board-certified rheumatologist from the Delaware Water Gap to the George Washington Bridge. Needless to say, that was a Herculean task to cover all of the many, many patients who were referred to me from physicians who used to send in to New York or to Philadelphia. I remember that the highlight of my becoming a rheumatologist takes me back to my last year at Yale New Haven. At that time, an advertisement came out in the New England Journal of Medicine that there was a new position, a new fellowship that was being started at Mount Sinai, funded by the National Institute of Health. I went for the interview along with 200 others and met the chief there, Dr. Harry Spira. And he took me, I was the sixth interview, he took me down the hallway and showed me a male, about 30 years of age, bent over, and he said to me, Alan, make a diagnosis. And I did, and I said, he has ankylosing spondylitis. And he said, you have the position of the first fellow at Mount Sinai. I then uh, entered a group of all Mount Sinai uh, doctors. There was one, I think, from Albert Einstein. We were all subspecialists. And I divided my time uh, mainly between uh, several hospitals and taught at the medical center. I would leave the office at about uh, 8 o'clock at night, having started at 6.30 in the morning, and then go to other hospitals to do consultations. My wife, who has been with me over 50 years and helped put me through medical school, she brought up my three sons till uh, they all left for college, and I'm very appreciative of all the work that she's done um, uh, to do that. Wow, thank you so much for that history. I've had the privilege of knowing you for probably close to 30 to 40 years, potentially. Uh, I had the privilege of growing up with your three boys, uh, graduated high school with Howard. I was very, very good friends with Howard uh, during my childhood years and high school years. Uh, I have fantastic memories of that relationship with Howard. In addition, uh, I remember working at a gym in Wyckoff, and you and your wife would uh, very frequently uh, work out in that gym in Wyckoff called The Gym, uh, where I worked behind the desk and as a trainer, and I have very fond memories of, of those years. In fact, like I've told you many, many times, forever be indebted to you for your advice and wisdom, guidance and direction in helping me... Uh, uh, maybe get into medical school and actually uh, land my first uh, uh, hospital privileges at Valley Hospital in Ridgewood, uh, writing my letters of recommendation uh, for medical school and uh, programs that I would wish to matriculate in. And uh, I'm just forever indebted and grateful for all of that and feel so honored and privileged to have you here with us today. Uh, your wisdom and expertise, which fund of knowledge and experience is just uh, indescribable. And just so happy to have you with us today uh, to talk to us all and educate our community of patients about this very important condition called rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is very different from other forms of arthritis 
And it's very, very important to distinguish between rheumatoid arthritis and other forms of arthritis. So Dr. Zolkowitz, why don't you tell our community of listeners and viewers why it's important to distinguish between the different types of arthritis, and then we'll get into focusing on rheumatoid arthritis. Arthritis is an inflammation of a joint or joints like the knees, the hips, the hands, the feet. This leads to inflammation and uh, stiffness and pain in those joints. It may be years uh, before the actual inflammation and joint pain develop. Generally, there are about a hundred different types of arthritis from infectious arthritis, of which most of you heard about Lyme disease, to uh, degenerative wear and tear arthritis, which is unfortunately about 33 million Americans have where cartilage and bone breaks down. And uh, a lot of orthopedists see the stages of it where one may need to have a joint replacement. Inflammatory arthritis is different. Uh, and the most common symmetrical uh, polyarthritis is rheumatoid arthritis that affects approximately 1% of the population. That means about one and a half million people in the United States. It's a progressive arthritis left untreated that can cause uh, deformity and severe uh, morbidity in the population. So just to elaborate on what Dr. Zolkowitz was mentioning, there's different forms of arthritis. Obviously, the most common form is degenerative wear and tear arthritis, but there are other forms as well. Dr. Zolkowitz alluded to the fact that there could be infectious arthritis, what we call septic arthritis, where an infection can get into the joint and destroy the joint as well. There's another condition called post-traumatic arthritis, where trauma can destroy the joints. But in today's podcast, we're going to focus our attention on inflammatory arthritis, where there's inflammation in the joint, which can also destroy the joint. And in the realm of inflammatory arthritis, there's different forms of inflammatory arthritis. But today's podcast will focus on a specific autoimmune condition called rheumatoid arthritis. So in rheumatoid arthritis, this is usually an illness of uh, women, three to one over men, and it usually uh, uh, happens at 30 to 60 years of age is the major peak. Um, and one of the reasons may be that you have a preponderance of women is that in this condition, female hormones can cause a pro-inflammatory effect uh, which uh, causes there to be a larger amount of rheumatoid disease in women and men. We find that in um, rheumatoid arthritis, that after 60, the incidence of uh, the disease is about equal, uh, male and female, because the hormone level in women decrease. The causes of rheumatoid arthritis which is really caused by the white blood cells that normally secrete uh, proteins and enzymes and inflammatory cells that usually protect the system from infection and inflammation goes out of whack. And these inflammatory, what we call cytokines, cause an inflammation on uh, the joints or on the muscles, or on the tendons or ligaments, causing systemic problems that can affect not only joints, but in rheumatoid arthritis, it can affect the heart. And therefore, in rheumatoid arthritis, you have an increased risk of heart disease and heart attacks and stroke. And if you control the rheumatoid arthritis, you eliminate that increased risk of heart attacks and stroke. It can affect the eyes where you get dry eyes, uh, uveitis, which is inflammation of the eyes. It can affect the lungs in about 10% of people where they get problems with uh, breathing. It can affect um, the skin where you get nodules in about 15% of patients by the elbows. So rheumatoid arthritis is ubiquitous in terms of affecting 
um, most uh, joints, we want to suppress the inflammatory condition. We want to suppress the cytokines. We want to suppress certain cytokines that are called leukotrienes and prostaglandins. And we can do that with medication. We can do that with certain uh, changes in our lifestyle. So just to further elaborate on what you just discussed, Dr. Zolkowitz, I think the take-home message is that unlike degenerative wear and tear arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease. It's important to remember that rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that really affects the entire body. It can result in uh, damage to organs, like you mentioned, the heart, the lungs. And so it's important to distinguish between other forms of arthritis, like post-traumatic arthritis, septic arthritis, degenerative wear and tear arthritis, and most importantly, be able to identify those patients that are suffering from a systemic disease like rheumatoid arthritis and get them in the hands of a uh, board-certified, fellowship-trained rheumatologist like Dr. Alan Zolkowitz. Let's take this opportunity to just explain to our audience what exactly is happening in this condition called rheumatoid arthritis. We already discussed that this is an autoimmune condition where the patient's immune system is essentially attacking itself. We've discussed that it can attack organs. We discussed that it can uh, attack even systems like the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system and other systems of the body. But specific to the joints, what's happening inside that joint? What's happening is that the inflammatory condition causes a certain um, enzymes and uh, hormones and cytokines to develop uh, what we call osteoclasts, and they eat up the bone and the cartilage and therefore destroy the joint. In addition, there's an inflammatory layer of tissue that forms that is called panis, and that causes the uh, bones again to become inflamed and to uh, deteriorate. Yeah, it's, a, it's primarily affecting the synovial lining of the joint, correct? Yes, the synovial lining of the joint is affected, and then it goes eventually uh, to cartilage and to bone and erodes the bone. And therefore, in a significant uh, case of rheumatoid arthritis, one develops erosions. When one sees erosions as a rheumatologist, um, and you see a patient for the first time, and they have them, you know that we have failed to prevent that. It used to be that one of the uh, hallmarks of rheumatoid arthritis in making the differential diagnosis is erosions. But if you see erosions, we've not been successful in preventing them because those are very difficult to reverse, if at all. So Dr. Zolkowitz, what are some of the risk factors when considering the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis in our patients? Are there some uh, risk factors that put patients at increased risk for getting diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis? Yes, uh, there are. Um, myself and some of the other rheumatologists that are part of uh, uh, Dr. Carroll's organization, we often emphasize that one must stop smoking. Smoking causes inflammation uh, to a great degree. In addition to smoking, we often make a great effort to have someone get down to their ideal weight. It's very interesting that uh, there are certain inflammatory markers in people overweight called leptins. And these leptins are those cytokines that travel in the blood system and can land in the heart and therefore lead you to more heart disease and heart attacks, can lead to the uh, joints and possibly uh, cause you to have more joint pain. So the takeaway is to be lean, not smoke, and to exercise regularly. Exercise is a very important thing. Even in people who have wear and tear arthritis, they should exercise under the physician's guidance or someone from physical therapy 
Because that's very helpful. It's so interesting to hear all this because when you're in medical school, they don't really teach us, at least not back when I attended medical school, that uh, autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis are associated with smoking and obesity and even exercise. So Dr. Zolkowitz, how does the typical patient present to your office? What is their chief complaint usually when they're being seen and you ultimately diagnose them with this condition called rheumatoid arthritis? They usually present with polyarthritis, uh, joint pain, swelling uh, of their uh, hands and feet. You can have other joints involved. What's most important is in comparison to some degenerative processes of the hands, it affects the large knuckles and the medium-sized knuckles and rarely ever affects the distal uh, knuckles, which is much more common in osteoarthritis. And they present with stiffness. That's a key here, stiffness, a gelation phenomenon that usually is over an hour and sometimes even longer than that. It's hard for them to get out of bed. The morning is the worst time for them. And as the day progresses, they get a little bit, a little bit better. We normally use uh, 15 to 30 minutes as a mock-off to determine inflammation more than 30 minutes to a few hours, non-inflammation less than 30 minutes, usually five to 15 minutes to determine whether it's inflammatory or not. These uh, patients can have significant fatigue. Fatigue may be overwhelming, and that's uh, a part of therapy that only the most recent biologics have addressed. Um, they often um, can have um, nodules by their elbow. They may have um, their joints not being able to be straightened. So yeah, I agree with you. When I'm taking a history in my office and, and talking to patients, uh, I definitely inquire about morning stiffness. Especially these, these patients are typically in the prime of their life, right? These are usually diagnosed more in women than men in the prime of their life. When they start complaining about morning stiffness, that's prolonged like you're describing, it's very concerning and that's when we'll often refer them to you for a rheumatological evaluation. Uh, in addition to that, because it is a systemic disease, an autoimmune disease, very often these patients will have systemic symptoms. Sometimes they'll have aches and chills, fever. Sometimes they'll be lethargic. They'll be tired a lot during the day as well. Are these some of the things you look for? Yes, uh, we look for them. In rheumatoid arthritis of the adult, uh, if you have fever, uh, that's a little unusual. It can happen, uh, and there is a condition called Stills disease, which is rheumatoid arthritis um, of the adult that's of a juvenile pattern, where the type of fever um, whether it's two or three times a day, gives away the diagnosis. And it's one of the pearls that uh, rheumatologists like myself use to make that diagnosis. But if we have fever, we start to uh, look towards infection and other types of autoimmune disorder like lupus, like vasculitis. Um, they often are uh, lethargic and fatigued. And for uh, a woman who... Um, has children, it may keep them in bed for such a long time that they have real difficulty taking care of their children. They have real difficulty holding a job. And there's a greater risk of those patients going on disability because they cannot do it uh, because this overwhelming um, systemic effect affects every part of their body. So Dr. Zalkowitz, I think it's very important to note everything you just described, because it's very different when patients present with the typical degenerative wear and tear arthritis. A lot of the patients will complain of stiffness with degenerative wear and tear arthritis, but often that stiffness is isolated specifically to the joint that's being evaluated. They'll say, Dr. Kale, my knee is stiff, my hip is stiff, my shoulder is stiff. But in rheumatoid arthritis, they'll very often complain of diffuse stiffness in their joints and typically in a symmetrical pattern and in typically the smaller joints of the body, right? Like the ankle, the elbows, the shoulders, joints that aren't as often involved in the 
more ubiquitous condition called degenerative wear and tear osteoarthritis. Is that correct? That's certainly correct. The thing that uh, um, haunts these uh, young women, again, they're three times as likely than men, is their hands, wrists, uh, feet, as mentioned, are have really stopped them from being able to function in business and at home with swelling of their joints. They're, these joints become swollen, warm, and hot. So yeah, everything you're mentioning, Dr. Zolkowicz, a lot of these things are not present in the typical orthopedic patient complaining of a painful joint. They may complain of stiffness, but it, again, it's not a systemic problem. It's typically not involving multiple joints, and it's typically not associated with other systemic complaints. So now, Dr. Zolkowicz, you've taken an adequate history you've begun to establish a differential diagnosis in your own mind that perhaps this patient is suffering from an inflammatory arthritis, maybe rheumatoid arthritis. What's next? What do you do on physical examination to try to really hone in on that diagnosis and really confirm that we're dealing with a patient that probably has rheumatoid arthritis? When we do the examination, we look very carefully at the skin. Something that has become much uh, less frequent are nodules by the elbows. They're usually non-tender. They're usually um, mobile. Um, we used to see them in New York at Mount Sinai frequently because we saw only the worst patients. Now we don't see them very frequently because patients are treated even by their primary care um, with um, medications, and therefore those medications interfere with inflammation. So specifically in rheumatoid arthritis, Dr. Zolkowitz, what do you typically find when you're focused on examining the joints of these patients? So we're looking for inflammation, swelling of the joints, warmth of the joints, difficulty in flexion or extending the joints. And sometimes we find that some of the joints um, form um, some abnormalities where they can look like swans, the joints, they're called swan neck deformities. And then there are these that are called boutonniere deformities that are specific for rheumatoid disease. We don't see that much as we did 30 uh, years ago because of a lot of the medications, for example, methotrexate, in my own view, has revolutionized the treatment but we look for whether uh, patients can straighten their joints, whether there's any warmth to the joints, whether there's any uh, uh, tapering of the joint, um, whether the patient uh, feels in the small joints this symmetrical uh, attack on their joints of their hands um, and their feet. Furthermore, a lot of these patients can have physical deformities of the fingers, something we call like a boutonniere deformity or a swan neck deformity, which we'll see sometimes in the hand. These are not common conditions in the orthopedic community. So you had mentioned, Dr. Zolkowitz, that when rheumatoid arthritis affects the hands, it typically involves certain joints in the hands. Can you demonstrate for our viewing audience at least what part of the hands are typically involved, which joints are involved typically with rheumatoid arthritis, and which joints are more commonly involved with the typical degenerative wear and tear osteoarthritis? In the hand, for example, we look at these joints called the metacarpal phalangeal joints, and we look at the proximal phalangeal joints. The distal and phalangeal joints are usually not involved. And what we look for is swelling, tapering, warmth, and we look to see whether they can fully flex and extend their joints. So yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Dr. Zolkowicz. When I see patients in the office and I see swelling around this joint right here, these joints, the metacarpophalangeal joints, uh, I very much think of a rheumatological condition. Very often these patients will have what's called an ulnar deviation deformity at the metacarpophalangeal joints as well where those fingers will be ulnarly deviated towards the ulna bone. So when we start to see a combination of these conditions, like the swelling, redness, and warmth in the metacarpal phalangeal joints, the ulnar drift in those joints, possibly a boutonniere deformity or a swan neck deformity, our antennas go up. And that's when we really want to refer that patient to Dr. Zolkowitz and our other physicians at the Kale Rheumatology Center to make sure we're not dealing with 
and autoimmune systemic disease such as rheumatoid arthritis. I think that's important when we're assessing patients, when these patients are complaining of a symmetrical nature of their joint pains and swelling, we definitely get concerned about an inflammatory autoimmune condition. And in addition, these conditions often affect the smaller joints of the body, right? The joints like the ankles, the elbows, the shoulders, much more commonly than the typical degenerative wear and tear osteoarthritis. In our profession, in orthopedics, we see way more patients suffering from knee arthritis and hip arthritis as opposed to ankle arthritis, for instance, or elbow arthritis, or even shoulder arthritis. And so when we start seeing a patient with multiple joints involved, with pain and bone-on-bone -bone deformity, in the smaller joints especially, we very much get concerned about inflammatory arthritis and that this patient may possibly be suffering from an autoimmune condition and it's really very important that we refer those patients for rheumatological evaluation. That's very true. These patients have to be picked up early. If it's very early, there is a possibility within uh, several weeks of uh, preventing uh, uh, the memory T cells. But the early you treat before you have uh, further damage and what we call panis, which is a thickening of the uh, tissue by a joint, the more that you can reverse this and put patients into remission. So Dr. Zalkowitz, what else can you do on physical examination to help support the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis? So we actually do a full examination, uh, the rheumatologist uh, with the uh, Kale group. And we look in particular at the uh, lungs. We're listening for what we call dry coarse rowels to suggest that the rheumatoid uh, is one of the 10% of patients who may have inflammation of their lungs, which require special therapy. We look at their eyes to see if they have dry eyes, to see if they have any inflammation called iritis or uveitis, which require a tumor necrosis factor that's different than other medications to treat them, because it also treats their eyes. Uh, we listen to their heart to see if they have any sign of any cardiac involvement of the heart, in particular, whether they have something called pulmonary hypertension that we can pick up on auscultation of the heart and an echocardiogram. We look to see if they have on abdominal examination an enlarged spleen, and that is something that we see infrequently, but it can happen. And most importantly, we look at the nervous system, the nerves, uh, and we do uh, check for whether these people have a peripheral neuropathy. Because if we catch a peripheral neuropathy due to rheumatoid disease, and we are able to confirm that with an EMG nerve conduction, then there is medication uh, to control that but it also signifies to us to look for underlying inflammatory disorder called vasculitis. Wow, that was so helpful, Dr. Zolkowitz. So at this point, it sounds like you've taken an adequate history, the patient's chief complaint, their history of their present illness, their physical examination are all pointing and suggesting rheumatoid arthritis as a diagnosis. What other objective tests can you do to further support that diagnosis? One of the things that we do are joint films, specifically uh, hand involvement, wrist involvement. But then again, we're not likely to find significant findings in today's uh, age. We rarely see erosions. Again, if they're present, you have a, di a general diagnosis and the patient hasn't been treated correctly. What we look for is swelling of the joints. What we look for is something where there's some inflammation of the side of joints called periostitis. We often see on uh, the uh, proximal phalangeal joints that I showed in the metacarpal phalangeal joints, we may see some signs of some osteopenia, that means thinning of the joints on either side of the joint. Sometimes you can see a subluxation of the joints as well, which can contribute in the diagnosis, correct? Yes, we see them uh, uh, on occasion. Not as, Again, not as often as we did 
20, 30 uh, years ago. Because you're diagnosing and treating them sooner. Sooner, exactly. With better medications. Right. Uh, as far as other imaging modalities, what else can you employ to assist in the diagnosis? Well, this is very key. Um, we want to treat early to prevent panis formation and prevent erosions that we see on a regular film, and that's by ultrasound and MRI. We try ultrasound first because it's very simple, um, and in a skilled person who does ultrasound, they can pick up tenosynovitis, inflammation of the tendons and the synovium of the joint, and possibly some uh, early erosions before they appear on the x-ray. But more and more to me, and to most rheumatologists, the gold standard is the MRI. Again, what we're looking for is edema. Even something as simple as edema will lead to erosions. And if I see edema on an MRI, that would get me to use a biologic on a patient. If I saw tenosynovitis, certainly very aggressive. If I saw erosions um, on an MRI, all guns uh, uh, would be used to try and prevent further erosions and try and see if we can get some of those erosions to reverse, uh, which happens on occasion. So again, the key uh, is regular x-ray, ultrasound, uh, MRI, the yeah. key for a rheumatologist. Absolutely. It sounds like to me the, the key here is the early diagnosis and treatment. And really nothing's better in early diagnosis than MRI, especially in this condition. The MRIs are so sensitive. It'll show that edema. It'll show that early erosions around the joint, inflammation, that we cannot appreciate on plain radiographs. So I think it's a very, very important point that you've just made. So now that we've made the diagnosis, you've done the history, physical examination, you've, you've uh, looked at some of these imaging studies, are there any labs that uh, you can order to support that diagnosis as well? Yes, uh, laboratory work for a rheumatologist is uh, the bane of patients because it means we take a lot of blood and we take a lot of blood often when we follow the patients because they need recurrent uh, visits to see how they're doing and making adjustments in their medication. So the test that we use for inflammation in general is called a SED rate and a C-reactor protein. They're elevated in inflammatory arthritis, but can be elevated in infection as well. So we have to be very careful. But in degenerative osteoarthritis, they're not elevated or borderline. What about the rheumatoid factor serology test? So the uh, rheumatoid factor testing um, is the latex fixation and the CCP antibody. One of the specific inflammatory markers in rheumatoid disease is called a Vectra D, which is rather uh, more specific for inflammation. The testing that we do is we can do a latex fixation for rheumatoid arthritis that is positive in about three quarters of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis. It's not as specific as we would like because you can see that in people who have hepatitis and arthritis, tuberculosis and arthritis, sarcoidosis and arthritis. Uh, the test that we use more is uh, called uh, an ACP, an anti-citrulline uh, peptide antibody. The anti-citrulline peptide antibody is found mainly in rheumatoid arthritis. It has a specificity of anywhere from 95 to 97%. So if you have someone who looks they have rheumatoid arthritis clinically, and there's some edema on MRI, or you see some tenosynovitis on an ultrasound, and if you have a positive CCP antibody, you've made the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Moreover, the CCP antibody is those patients that develop the more severe type of crippling rheumatoid arthritis that you want to be most aggressive with. The small percentage of rheumatoids that have CCP negative rheumatoid arthritis, you treat the same. They don't respond to biologics quite as well, but they have a better prognosis. The higher the level of the CCP antibody, 
the worse the prognosis. So if you have a CCP antibody that's mildly elevated, that's much better than someone who has a strongly elevated CCP antibody. Now, I will do other blood work. I will do a serum protein electrophoresis to see if these uh, patients have early signs of what we call a monoclonal gammopathy that can lead to an illness called amyloidosis or multiple myeloma, which rheumatoids are more prone to develop. I will do blood work for other autoimmune disorders like lupus and vasculitis. And I will do blood work uh, if they have another type of genetic uh, disease called HLA-B27 arthritis, uh, like psoriasis or ankylosing spondylitis. I might do parvoviral uh, titers. And if they have a high IgM titer, I will uh, uh, tell them that they probably have parvoviral disease. I will do a hepatitis level uh, and profile on them. And I'll do a test for tuberculosis because if uh, they're going to go on methotrexate or biologic, they have to be... Um, TB negative. If they have had TB, uh, you can treat them if they uh, uh, with biologics and methotrexate if their TB is dormant, and the blood test will tell you that. Do all patients that have rheumatoid factor always test positive for the latex test and or the anti-CCP test? So uh, patients who have uh, rheumatoid factor or latex fixation um, don't necessarily have to have rheumatoid arthritis. As I mentioned, it's uh, a nonspecific test. You can have it in hepatitis. You can have it in other inflammatory disorders. The CCP antibody test is specific for rheumatoid disease. What most people have to understand is they can have a positive latex fixation or rheumatoid factor or a CCP for years and not have rheumatoid develop, rheumatoid arthritis develop. Uh, it uh, um, uh, can take up to four and a half years for them to develop the inflammation, the stiffness, the symmetrical uh, polyarthritis of the hands and feet and other joints. Uh, so, um, but when we test for it, uh, if that's positive, it would mean we are going to be very aggressive in treatment. But could it work the other way, where they do have the diagnosis but don't have positive uh, latex tests and or anti-CCP tests? Yeah. So a latex is positive 75% of the time. So you can have a latex positive um, and have uh, hepatitis. You can have it with viral uh, arthritis, which by the way uh, is in a differential and usually is gone within six to eight weeks. Um, uh, whereas rheumatoid lasts longer. Um, so latex is not specific. Uh, CCP antibody is rather specific for rheumatoid disease, especially if they have uh, history compatible with it, positive um, vector, uh, positive C-reactive protein and sed rate. And if they have uh, on MRI edema or tenosynovitis on ultrasound. The seronegative uh, patient that has negative CCP antibodies uh, and has a negative latex has a much uh, milder disease. And you can have uh, people who have a latex fixation that's negative and have rheumatoid disease or a latex fixation that's positive and not have rheumatoid disease. I think that with CCP antibody, if you have the uh, uh, test positive, you have rheumatoid arthritis. If it's negative, then the chance of uh, having rheumatoid arthritis is remote, possible, but only by a few percentages of patients. The common culprit in a lot of medical conditions is inflammation these days. There are several other things that a lot of my patients take that can affect inflammation. First, uh, the uh, turmeric. Uh, and curcumin that a lot of people take on their own. It is anti-inflammatory. It has approximately the same anti-inflammatory effect as some of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like uh, Celebrex, for example. Um, I just want to spend one moment on Celebrex um, because 
um, it does not affect the platelet and therefore does not interfere with coagulation like the other anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen. Um, and therefore, it's one of the medications that one can use if one has to in people who have um, conditions where they're taking a blood thinner. But turmeric, you have to be careful of, and all the over-the-counter preparations you have to really Google the side effects. For example, it can cause oxalate formation. So if you've had a kidney stone, we don't recommend that you take it. If you have iron deficiency anemia, we don't suggest that you take it because it can interfere with iron absorption. If you're on a blood thinner, we don't recommend that you take it. Something else that's very important Oh, omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are very anti-inflammatory and have been used in the past in patients who have heart disease to help with their uh, cholesterol profile. We know that they're anti-inflammatory, whereas omega-6 and omega-9 fatty acids have the opposite effect. But again, if you're going to go to surgery to get a hip or a knee replacement, you must stop that as well as any non-steroidal or um, uh, uh, turmeric before you're going to go to surgery for about a week at least because it can cause some uh, bleeding. Other things that uh, people have taken are chondroitin and uh, glucosamine that have a beneficial effect on cartilage whether it's in inflammatory disorders or degenerative disorders, it too can have an effect on a medication, Coumadin, if you're taking it. Most people come in and they talk about having ginger tea, which has an anti-inflammatory effect. And I do recommend that, but in degenerative wear and tear arthritis, the Scandinavians have shown clearly that rose hip uh, tea or by mouth has a beneficial effect on arthritis of the knees and of the hands. In addition, in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, a large study showed that um, if you uh, take um, jello, it will help the arthritis of someone in their knees. So there are a lot of things that you can do but most importantly, to reduce inflammation is watch your weight, don't smoke, and get down to an ideal weight. What is the best diet? Well, the best diet generally is a Mediterranean diet. In people who have an inflammatory disorder that's very painful called gout, which is by a different mechanism of elevated uric acid, we usually have people on a low purine diet. In terms of uh, inflammation, we have changed over the last 30 years the prognosis in rheumatoid arthritis and in most of the inflammatory autoimmune conditions by using disease-modifying anti-inflammatory drugs and what we uh, call um, biologics. The uh, biologics can affect the basic cause of the uh, disease. In rheumatoid arthritis, there are three different uh, mechanisms uh, that we attack. One is called tumor necrosis factor. That is made in the system to fight uh, and prevent tumors. But we also note that in rheumatoid arthritis, and in most uh, inflammatory disorders, like psoriatic arthritis, which about 3 million people in the world have, and is one of the differential diagnoses from rheumatoid disease, and is a non-symmetrical arthritis, whereas rheumatoid arthritis is usually symmetrical, the major... Um, things that we attack are different. In rheumatoid arthritis, we try and attack tumor necrosis factor. We try and attack 
something called interleukin-6 and interleukin-1. So we have now medications that will specifically attack those pathways and cause people to go into remission. Whereas years ago, we used aspirin and uh, we used a drug called penicillamine and uh, we used gold and we had very little benefit. Now, what I've noticed over my career is that we've made such a great difference in rheumatoid arthritis that we really see now someone who has crippling disease. And the reason for that mainly is when the drug methotrexate, which was used for hundreds of years to treat tumors and malignancy, was utilized to treat rheumatoid arthritis once a week by mouth, and if you go into higher doses, subcutaneously by injection. And that by itself, without anything else, has caused one in three rheumatoids to go into remission. When that is not enough, we then usually add other oral agents, a drug called hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil that's had a lot of play in the literature in COVID, where it may not play a role uh, and may not be beneficial, but in rheumatoid arthritis and especially lupus, it is life-saving and has changed the whole lifestyle of patients with systemic lupus and their average age would be up to 55. Now I have patients with lupus who are in their 70s, 80s, and have had lupus for over 40 years with the use of uh, Plaquenil and methotrexate and other disease-modifying biologics. We sometimes use even a drug called azulfidine or sulfasalazine, which is used in uh, people who have inflammatory bowel disease and in people who have bladder infections over the course of years. In fact, in Europe, it was the drug of choice for many years in terms of treating rheumatoid disease until they too learned from us here in America that methotrexate was the drug of choice. I would venture to say that all of our rheumatologists in the CALE organization, and we have a large experience over 80 years between the several who are in the group, will all start a patient with rheumatoid disease and most inflammatory arthritis is with methotrexate. We're not certain how it works, actually, but it may have an effect on folic acid metabolism of inflammatory cells, and therefore, we don't want patients to become folate deficient, which is uh, a vitamin B like B12, so we give them uh, uh, folic acid uh, along with the methotrexate. When we have patients who do not respond well enough to methotrexate, possibly using hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil, and sometimes using azulfidine, which is a triple therapy, which was uh, um, uh, used now for about 25 years rather successfully, then we go on uh, to use a biologic. There are some people, uh, myself included, who use a biologic much earlier. There's some evidence that if you use methotrexate or a biologic within the first few months, first 14 to 16 weeks of rheumatoid arthritis, that perhaps you stop the T cells Remember that uh, we've learned from COVID that there are B cells. Um, the body makes two types of uh, lymphocytes that help uh, with uh, inflammation in a positive manner and in inflammatory disorders in a negative manner. One are called B cells and the other are called T cells or uh, thymus um, the derived the cells. If you give medication early in rheumatoid arthritis, you can prevent the T cell 
from forming memory uh, cells and memory antibodies. If you prevent the memory cells from developing and you treat a patient early enough, you may be able to cure them in the long run. Other than that, you can only hope to put patients into remission. Now, that's something that was unheard of 20 to 30 years ago when the first biologic came out and we first started using methotrexate, often together. The biologics that we use now are multiple, depending on whether we think someone has tumor necrosis factor as the primary cause of their rheumatoid disease, or interleukin-6 or interleukin-1. The tumor necrosis factor uh, inhibitors that we know of and use today, the most common one is Umira, which is now has biosimilars, so it's made the cost much, much cheaper, and it's given subcutaneously every two weeks. Uh, one that I like a great deal is called Remicade, which is an intravenous and one of the oldest. So I have a long history of the side effects of uh, Remicade and Umira as well. And you have more play with that. In Umira, you give the same dose to someone who's skinny or someone who's heavy. Again, you want to be not heavy. Um, in Remicade, you have the ability to uh, alter the dose and alter the time frame that you give the medication. Um, others now uh, that affect the interleukin-6 system are drugs called Actemra and Kevzara. Um, what I'd like to spend a moment and get off rheumatoid disease is that at age 60, I mentioned that men are as frequently involved with rheumatoid disease as women because their estrogen level decreases. Um, um, age 60 and above, we find another uh, condition that has muscular and joint involvement called polymyalgia rheumatica. And perhaps we'll have a session just on that. But over 60, it's just as frequent as rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the things that the rheumatologists at the uh, Kale centers have shown is that we can now treat polymyalgia rheumatica and we have biologics for that. And those biologics are the ones that inhibit interleukin-6. So when you have someone uh, over age 60, especially if it's a, a female, uh, you need to look for polymyalgia as part of your differential from a rheumatoid arthritis. It's uh, treated very similarly, but not quite the same. In addition, you have to make certain that you're not missing some other types of arthritis that are very common. Uh, one would be uh, infectious arthritis. I mentioned Lyme disease early, and we're in the time period where you have Lyme disease, it's usually spring, summer, and fall, and it's usually done by a spirochete that gives you um, a bite that you can't see the spirochete. It's usually under the armpit by the groin, by the uh, backside, and then you get a, a certain type of uh, erythematous reddish rash that clears in the center, and then you get usually one joint, usually a knee, but it could be an ankle or a, a wrist. Rarely does it cause a polyarthritis like you get in rheumatoid disease and doesn't usually affect small joints, hands and feet uh, as rheumatoid arthritis does. But there's also parvovirus. Uh, moms will know that and teachers will know that because it's called fifth disease amongst children. And it's very common. And in children, you get a big red rash on the face and they can develop arthritis and fever. In adults, you don't get any rash. You just develop a polyarthritis. And a certain percentage of those patients 
go on to form rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and are treated often the same. Why is it important to know uh, and to test for parvovirus? Because often it will get better by itself with time. And that's very reassuring uh, to a patient. So I know, Dr. Zolkowitz, that you mentioned some of the uh, medical therapies for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, but I think it's so important for our viewing audience to understand the difference between treating symptoms and actually modifying the course of disease in this medical condition. Uh, some of the medications that you mentioned are called DMARDS, D-M-A-R-D-S, which are actually disease-modifying anti-rheumatoid drugs, which actually positively affect the ultimate outcome for these patients. They can actually cause this condition to stop progressing and actually go into remission. And sometimes, as you've indicated, actually be curative if you can diagnose them and treat them early enough. But disease-modifying anti-rheumatoid drugs, such as methotrexate, and hydroxychloroquine, also the uh, biological disease-modifying anti-rheumatoid drugs that you've mentioned, like Humira, actually have this effect on these medical conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and others that you've mentioned. There are other treatments for rheumatoid arthritis as well, which do help with the symptoms of arthritis. We already discussed that arthritis is associated with a tremendous amount of inflammation, and inflammation is the main culprit here in this autoimmune disease. It is, in fact, our body's immune system, which is attacking our cells. The immune system is attacking not only the joints in rheumatoid arthritis, but as we've mentioned previously, it's affecting our organs as well, the heart, the lungs, the vascular system, and others. And so anti-inflammatory medications are very, very helpful in this condition. As we've mentioned, some are disease-modifying anti-inflammatory medications, like the ones we've previously mentioned, but there are others that treat the symptoms but do not actually modify the prognosis and outcome. What are some of those other anti-inflammatory? Some are over-the-counter and some are prescription strength. So we do use uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They've been around for many years. Some are over-the-counter, like ibuprofen and Aleve. Most of the ones that uh, I use are by prescription. Um, interestingly enough, the one that I use most is a drug called Celebrex. Um, it's a sulfur preparation, so you have to be careful in those people who are allergic to sulfur. Uh, and the reason that I use that, as I mentioned, it does not interfere with anyone who is on a blood thinner. Um, in addition, uh, in a large study in the uh, Cleveland Clinic comparing uh, Celebrex in to patients um, who have heart disease with ibuprofen and naproxen, it showed less morbidity and less mortality. So I use that um, as my go-to medication. Uh, others, uh, diclofenac uh, or Voltaren is probably the strongest, although most rheumatologists would say that most of the anti-inflammatory drugs are interchangeable in terms of their potency. I should mention that both orthopedists and um, rheumatologists use a drug like Voltaren, diclofenac, in a cream form uh, or an ointment form that we apply to a knee, for example, um, or um, a joint that's uh, typically giving more difficulty. I would mention again that if you're on a blood thinner especially, you should uh, make certain that your physician is knowledgeable enough to know that not all non-steroidals are the same in terms of causing an increased bleeding problem. And that I do recommend, if you're not allergic to sulfur, that you talk to them about using Celebrex. We have used non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for many years. They're both by prescription and uh, over-the-counter. I should caution that they're great drugs, but they have potential for side effects on kidney and the cardiovascular system. So it should be under the care of a physician and you should have blood work monitored. We also use steroids, 
that's a, a form of uh, prednisone or uh, medrol that we use often to suppress inflammation, either in a pulse, we give it for a short period of time, or a longer period of time if we need it. We, it's a, those are great medications. They take away the inflammation in the hands and the feet and the joints of patients with inflammatory disorders. However, we're trying to get away from uh, uh, steroidals because steroidals have an effect in raising blood pressure, glaucoma, diabetes, uh, and osteoporosis. So again, if you're on a corticosteroid, you, that needs to be under the care of a physician that has a lot of experience with it. Yeah, absolutely. And in my field of orthopedics, uh, I definitely poo-poo the usage of steroids as much as possible because we are the ones that see and appreciate and treat the dreaded complication of steroids called avascular necrosis, where the AVN or avascular necrosis can deleteriously lead to the death of the bone uh, in the joint, leading to collapse, arthritis, and the need for hip, knee, shoulder, or ankle replacement. And I think it's so important to emphasize once again that now that we're talking about joints, when we definitively treat these patients and treat their joints that have been destroyed by this inflammatory autoimmune condition, we are not yet done treating the patient. As opposed to an osteoarthritis, degenerative wear and tear arthritis, for instance, we talked about hip and knee arthritis are so common. When we replace those joints, we've cured essentially that patient of that arthritis in that hip or in that knee or in that shoulder or in that ankle. That is not the case with inflammatory autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. These patients may ultimately still require a hip replacement, a knee replacement, a shoulder replacement, or an ankle replacement, but we're not done treating that patient. That patient can still get arthritis or inflammation in that joint due to the autoimmune condition because the synovial lining is still there. And if the patient suffers a flare-up of their underlying autoimmune condition, they can still get inflammation, swelling, and pain in that joint. Yes, we get rid of most of the pain from the bone-on-bone -bone erosions that occurred secondary to the inflammatory arthritis by doing the hip or knee or shoulder or ankle replacement, but we do not get rid of the synovial lining or tissue, and so they can still get symptoms. And that's why it's incumbent upon us to distinguish between a typical degenerative osteo wear and tear arthritis from an autoimmune condition, because that patient will more than likely require a lifelong treatment by an expert such as Dr. Zalkowitz, so that we can continue to suppress the autoimmune condition so it doesn't continue to affect other joints of the body. Do you agree with that, Dr. Zalkowitz? Yes, I certainly do. Um, some of the information has suggested that about 25% of patients can get off the medication over a period of time. But of those 25%, about half of those flare within a year or two. And then when you reapply the medication, unfortunately, it doesn't work as well. Mm. So what we try and do is get patients off tumor necrosis factor inhibitors or other interleukin inhibitors and see if they still do well, get them off of a methotrexate if uh, we can. We certainly make an effort to get these patients off of uh, steroids because they're the ones that have a long-term effect, not only in vascular necrosis, but in cardiovascular problems and uh, cataracts and, um, uh, uh, and in healing. So in some patients who are fortunate and able to look like they're in remission, that means they have no stiffness, swelling, no uh, uh, joint pain, they have full flexion, extension, and there's no active inflammatory process going on clinically. And their laboratory work, namely their sed rate and their C-reactive protein are normal. We try and wean these patients down off of medication. We certainly start with uh, corticosteroids. That means prednisone, medrol. We try to wean them off of that slowly and progressively and look to see if there's any sign 
clinically of them uh, worsening. Next, we try and uh, wean them off their uh, tumor necrosis factor inhibitor or their interleukin-6 or interleukin-1 inhibitor, their biologic. Uh, that may be by using a biologic uh, like Umira that's used every two weeks, going to every three weeks or every four weeks or even further. And then when we're satisfied they're being able to withstand being off the biologic, then we will wean down the methotrexate slowly. Uh, this can take a year or so uh, to do. And when they're off methotrexate, then we try and see if we can wean them down or maybe keep them on just some hydroxychloroquine, uh, perhaps uh, one a day or one every other day, uh, having their eyes looked at uh, every six months uh, by an ophthalmologist. Uh, if we're fortunate and we're able to get some patients off, probably about 25% over the course of time, about half of those a uh, few years later will have a flare of activity. And that flare of activity can be just as they uh, presented originally with swelling of their small joints of their hands and uh, feet and their peripheral other joints and uh, can be accompanied by stiffness, swelling, pain, and uh, difficulty straightening their joints. Their sed rate and C-reactor protein in their blood goes up. And those patients we put back on medication, and unfortunately, only about half of those respond. The other half will have significant difficulty and will be difficult to treat thereafter. So what a lot of us do is we wean off cortisone, that's an absolute, and try and wean them off non-steroidals, uh, or they can stay on a non-steroidal if their kidney function is and blood pressure are reasonably normal. Uh, we then try and wean them off a biologic. Those are the, that's the mainstay. If we can get by with uh, methotrexate and possibly hydroxychloroquine, um, and the patient's doing well, uh, we may be satisfied with that if we can get the methotrexate down to a low dose. So how do you follow these patients, Dr. Zolkowicz? Once you've made the diagnosis and you began medical therapy, what's the typical follow-up for these patients? So there is the use of uh, prednisone, which I told you we try and get patients off, but we often use prednisone at the beginning is what we call bridge therapy, because it takes methotrexate uh, several weeks, plaquenil several weeks, and biologics several weeks for them to start to kick in. The prednisone in very small doses will usually do the trick. The patient will feel better. We'll usually start them on methotrexate, either that first visit or quite soon, and then we'll follow them clinically by the amount of stiffness they have in the morning, by looking at their joints for swelling, uh, for whether they have any inflammation of the redness, or, and we'll look to see what the sed rate and C-reactor protein, they should be coming down. And then we will probably see them every few weeks at the beginning, and then when they're in re, uh, doing very well or possibly in remission, probably every 8 to 12 weeks. Uh, I have some patients that I've now been in remission for several years that I see every six months to a year. And they come to me from all over the country <laughs> because I put them into remission. So they, I think, feel that if they come to me, they're going to stay in remission, even though they have a rheumatologist either it, uh, um, uh, in Florida or in North Carolina or in Connecticut or even in uh, South America. And how often do you use combination therapy? That's a great question. I always use combination therapy, uh, just like we do in high blood pressure. Um, in fact, I think that the people uh, who use uh, combination therapy in high blood pressure learn from us, the rheumatologists, we always have patients on methotrexate, almost always. Uh, we often have patients on an antimalarial uh, hydroxychloroquine or plaquenil. We sometimes have them on sulfazalazine, which is a sulfur preparation, and we have them often 
if they're CCP positive or have uh, on an MRI um, signs of uh, edema or tenosynovitis on a biologic. So they're on several medications. Now, some of those are on a non-steroidal as well if they're not on prednisone. I rarely ever use a non-steroidal with uh, prednisone at the same time because it increases the risk of an NSAID uh, gastropathy. That means inflammation of the stomach that can lead to bleeding. And it's silent because if you bleed in the stomach, you the nerve endings uh, are dulled. So it increases the risk of bleeding sevenfold. So rarely ever will I use prednisone or a non -steroidal. Sometimes I'll be able to get by with a non uh, as bridge therapy instead of uh, prednisone. In a mild patient, usually who's CCP negative uh, and usually uh, has just some uh, edema uh, or juncta articular osteoporosis. Very interesting. Well, Dr. Zalkowitz, as you know, uh, and I've mentioned many, many times, I chose to be an orthopedic surgeon because I appreciate instant gratification. I like fixing things that are broken, and I get that instant reward for the most part. Thank God there are doctors like you who, who deal regularly with chronic disease, because this is, in fact, a chronic disease, right? It's not like osteoarthritis, like I mentioned, that we can do a hip replacement or knee replacement or a meniscus tear and take care of that surgically, where I fix the problem and the patient gets on with their life. This patient is your patient for life. And the onus is on you to quarterback the care of that patient, hold that patient's hand and manage that patient medically to keep that patient remission their entire lives once that diagnosis has been made. Because this is a chronic disease that we had already mentioned is progressive and can go on literally to kill patients, right? So it's so important because of the, the cardiovascular involvement and the involvement of other organs that this condition can literally kill patients. So it's so, so important for the medical community to understand this diagnosis, to identify it and diagnose it early with treatment and refer the patient to a rheumatologist like Dr. Zolkowitz so that he or she can hold their hands their entire lives and keep their condition at bay to keep them healthy and active and live a long, vivacious life. Do you agree with that, Dr. Zolkowitz? Yes. Uh, there are a few, just a few caveats I'd like to add. Number one, unfortunately, we're not making enough rheumatologists. Um, there's usually in most centers a six-month wait for a new patient to be seen. And generally, they're seen by a physician assistant or nurse practitioner who are knowledgeable but don't have the experience of a well-trained rheumatologist who's been in practice. Fortunately, when Dr. Kale and I discussed about joining rheumatology and orthopedists, he understood that these are lifelong patients that need a lot more time because they have a lot more underlying pathology and develop infection, heart attacks, a lung involvement, kidney involvement, um, uh, amyloidosis, multiple myeloma. So they're often followed by five or six other doctors that we as rheumatologists have to look at their notes and see how they're doing. And what's so wonderful about being a rheumatologist in the kale group is we're allowed the time to deal with these patients, to help them, and to help the doctors that are treating them in other fields uh, to know how the rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune disorders is, are playing a role in their patient's heart disease or lung disease or kidney disease or neurological disease because we know a lot about it, probably more than they do, because we see a lot more of it in our particular field. And we're so blessed to have each other right in our practice. It's a multi-specialty group. Uh, it's a collaborative effort with experts in every field where we're caring for these patients. And I must say, this has been a very enlightening discussion. I've learned so much from you once again, Dr. Zolkowitz, and I appreciate your knowledge, wisdom, and expertise. Um, I hope that you have found this to be very informative 
and helpful in your evaluation and management of your patients and your conditions. And I just want to take this opportunity to say how thankful I am that you're part of our practice, caring for our patients all these years. It's just a blessing to have you, Dr. Zolkowitz. And I look forward to having you come back in the future so we can talk about other rheumatological conditions. And thank you so much for your time and wisdom and expertise. Thank you so much. And remember, at Kale, as it says on the sign, we'll see you soon. So if you have a rheumatological problem, you're not going to wait six months or six weeks. It's a matter of days before one of the various rheumatologists look at you. We look at you ourselves. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.